Thank you for joining in with us again during our devotion time. It is uh, Tuesday and April 21st. And, uh, you know, we've been considering some of the early Psalms these last few days and looking at David's cry for help as he was uh, facing persecution, trials, troubles. And today I want to turn our attention to Psalm 8. And I'd like to use this psalm to take time to consider uh, Jesus's manner in which he taught us to pray, where he said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Uh, God's name is separate from any other name. Uh, by that we mean uh, it is sacred, it is holy, it is set apart far and above any other name given to man, to beast, or to any a celestial being or uh, creation. It's uh, His name is far and above and holy. Uh, the Bible says His name is such a name in which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, Jesus, we learn through the revelation of the Bible that Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is God. Uh, Jesus was in the beginning with God, Jesus was with God, and Jesus is God. And so our Savior has created us, He has redeemed us, and by His own blood shed, He has pardoned us, and He has given us a new life to those who believe through the power of His resurrection. These are ways in which we can glorify and give great praise to God. The psalmist David in chapter 8 says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, the word majestic means large. It means excellent. It means powerful, um, mighty. It's, it's an incredible way to give praise to God. If we could just uh, take time, meditate on what God has done, is doing, and will continue to do in our life, our praise can become great before God. And I want to look at that this morning. In our prayer life, if, if we, we consider this, we need that devoted time, that special time set aside where uh, the distractions of the world cannot come upon us. Our phones are away from us. The TV is off. Just that devoted time in private to give God great glory. It's something that we as Christians often neglect. We uh, run into the throne room, if you will, uh, placing our petitions, our requests before God, and never stop and thank Him for what He has done who he is, and what he brings about in our life. And Psalm 8 is a great reminder of this uh, that we have. When we say, hallowed be thy name, Psalm 8 is a psalm that we can use to write some phrases down, coming from the word of God that we can in turn give back to God in our praise to him. Just as we looked at David's words as he cried out for help and we wrote those phrases down, we can write these phrases down in the manner in which to give uh, the greatness uh, to his name. Now, David penned this psalm and uh, we know that this psalm was set to music by the choir master. Since David is the author of this psalm, we need to consider what David has gone through in his life. Uh, has he experienced what we can learn from so that we too can give great, great praise to God? I want you to consider something about David. When he was just a, a boy, he had full faith and trust in God to face Goliath. He trusted that God would slay the giant, not David. And he was just a boy. And then as a teenager, God anoints him to be king of Israel. And if you read the account in scripture, you understand that King Saul was the king of Israel at that time. And we read in scripture that King Saul had this uh, spirit of jealousy and anger and sought to kill David because 
of what God was doing in his life and the installing David as to be the king. And so David was on the run all those years that King Saul was king, uh, literally on the run for his life. Um, after this period, and, and uh, Saul, by his own foolishness, is, is destroyed, and David becomes the king of Israel, we find that he has uh, uh, just a blessing in the Lord to have uh, a great united a kingdom. They find peace. Uh, there's prosperous year, years. And then uh, we read the account also that after he was established as king, that he went through some notable sins that caused a great consequence in his life, uh, a consequence of suffering in his life. And this trouble was even ultimately found in that his own flesh and blood, his son, sought to kill him and take his kingdom from him. So David knew times of persecution, not by anything that he had done, but that he had been called to. And he had found times of persecution because of things that he had done in sin. And in all these, we saw over the last couple Psalms that we've reviewed together, is that by faith, David cried out to God, and the testimony, the witness, the record is God heard David's prayers and God answered David. So the whole sum of David's life is one of leaning and growing ever closer to God. And the ingredient, the, uh, the, the wonder is in the prayers that David prayed and that God would hear and that God answered. And this is what we seek in our prayer life, that God would hear and that God would answer. Um, in, in each case, God delivered David, and through David's trials and sufferings, he learned to give great glory to God. Let me say that again, because this is something the Christian church in today's world needs to hear. David learned how to give great glory to God through his petitioning God to deliver him, and that God did deliver him. So our praised God is drawn greater and greater as we see what God is doing in our life. It, it all is in prayer, church, and through the word of God, we see the wonder of God, and it causes our prayers uh, even in, in times of great petitioning, to turn and to give great glory uh, to God. I want to read uh, James chapter 1 in just a couple of verses, 2 through 4, just kind of show you something about this for the church today. James writes that, he, he says, count it all joy. Now, uh, joy is that inward happiness, that inward uh, peace, uh, happiness with God. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet various kinds of trials. Trials of all kinds. Now, I've heard so many people say, how do you find joy in the trial? That's not what James is saying. He's saying count it all joy when you meet trials. Why? Because God is our great deliverer. It's not the trial we rejoice in. It's God's work and power that we rejoice in. He says, count it all joy when you meet various kinds of trials, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let the steadfastness, that steadiness in God in our prayer life, let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Let steadfastness, let your trust in God have the day, because then in that steadfastness, you will be made in his presence uh, complete and perfect. And that's what we're striving for. When we read the Bible, he's uh, created us, those of us who believe, he's, he's made us new, he's given us new life to be made into the image, uh, into the, the character, the following of Christ himself. And so our completeness our perfection is in Christ, and so we want to draw closer and closer. Well, how do we do this? We trust God in our petitions, and we give God great glory. We praise Him, 
And so it's through sufferings that much of our praise will come. Paul said to the church in Philippians chapter 1, he said, I want you to know, he wants the church to know, brethren, that what has happened to me, look at, look at Paul's life, uh, shipwrecks, imprisonments, beatings, hunger, thirst, all these things. What has happened to me has really served, here's the reason, to advance the gospel. Um, we don't understand sometimes why we're going through what we're going through, but if we would trust God, continue to plead his help toward us and trust him as he delivers, it causes great praise to God. Um, do we give up in our prayers? Do we blame God for our circumstance? Uh, we, we need to understand that we live in a broken world. We're seeing this now in the coronavirus. We live in a broken world. And here's what that means. My sin is going to cause trouble in my life. There's consequence. But at times, <clears throat> other people's sins will be cast upon me. I'm not the cause of the trouble, but I'm experiencing trouble because of the sins of of others. And then there's a third kind of trouble that we go through in that our environment is broken. When man sinned, the environment uh, has the consequence of brokenness as well. And so coronavirus is not anything that I have personally caused or that you have personally caused, but it's being exerted onto us because of the brokenness of the environment. So we suffer various kinds of trials, all kinds of trials. And in these sufferings, there is the testing that our faith will be proved strong or there's the temptation because the evil one simply wants to destroy us. He wants us to curse God. He wants us to blame God. He wants us to doubt God. Why? Because in that we are destroyed. But when we hold on to faith, when we walk in faith, we keep petitioning to our Lord and giving him great praise, great things in God take place. Joseph is an Old, Ta Old Testament example of this. Uh, Joseph, uh, although you could argue uh, that uh, he caused some of his uh, strife with his brothers, his brothers in fact sold him into slavery. Uh, he went through some dark, 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 dark valleys and hardships. And at the end of it all, Joseph says these words, for God sent me before you, talking to his brothers, for God sent me before you to preserve life. The reason Joseph went through what he went through was God had a plan. God was the defender. God was the protector. God was the sustainer. Joseph was the one that God was working through to show his glory. Church, there is no difference with us today to those of us who believe. We exist to glorify the name of God. God has works for us that were planned before the foundation of the world. And so in our prayer life, we need to keep in proper perspective of who God is, who we have been created as, and what is our purpose. That's to glorify God and to enjoy his presence forever. That is our purpose. And so what we go through, God is the great help. And it is God we are to praise, not give credit to any other or any other name. It is God who sustains us and brings us through. Uh, suffering in the trust of God and his promises produces great praise. Suffering in the trust of God. What, what, what do I mean when I say that? To trust God always is going to have a suffering involved in it because uh, on a simplistic level, we want to do it our way, but we must go God's way. But also there'll be those who are opposed to us for doing it God's way. So suffering in the trust of God and his promises to deliver uh, produces a great praise from our lips to God. A suffering without the hope or the trust of God and his promises given to us leads to ruin in our life, leads to destruction without any help from God. Really weigh those matters. What, what are your blessings and what are your trials that you're experiencing today? Are you giving glory to God and are you petitioning God for great help? And as you petition him, do you already know because of your faith being strengthened 
that God will deliver, that God is the deliverer, and that he will hear when I call. This is where we are striving in our prayer life. Now, as we pray and God hears, we see mighty works of God take place that bring forth great praises to him. We see this in David's psalm. If you will uh, turn there with me, if you're not there already in Psalm 8, uh, you see he begins his psalm, his song to God uh, in great praise. He says, O Lord, our Lord. Uh, let me pause the word. The first time he says, Lord, that is uh, Jehovah, self-eternal, uh, self-existent, eternal God. Uh, God supreme, our Lord which is the word Adonai that we use in the New Testament, means master, controller, sovereign. So the eternal God who is master over us is, is what he's saying. Now you see, hallowed is his name. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic, how, how wide, how infinite, how glorious, how excellent is your name in all the earth. He's looking around his boundary of the earth, David is, and he's saying, how glorious is your name. Then look what he does. He says, you have set your glory, this, uh, this majesty, this power, this incredibleness. You have set your glory above the heavens. David's on earth. He looks around and says, uh, how majestic is your name in all this earth. And then he looks up and he says, you've set your glory even above the heavens. And so down in verse 3, he says, when I look at your heavens... When was the last time you paused and just looked at God's creative hand in this world and looked up on a clear night and seen the beauty of the stars uh, when the, the moon is out and just meditated on the glory, the power of God in that creative work? Now, when I say that, I, I always think, ah, I know people deny creation. I, I can't let that distract from me giving glory to God. If people want to give glory for what we have to something other or something else, that's their judgment. My praise is going to be God for being creator. Most people think that Genesis 1 and 2 are the only verses that speak of creation. The entire word of God from Genesis to Revelation speaks of God's creative hand. And we find in the book of Revelation that when we're finally... Uh, lifted and in the presence of God at his throne, one of the new songs we sing refers to him specifically as creator. So I'm not going to give God's glory to something other. If people want to believe that, that's within them, but it should not deter from our faith of what the word of God says. Either God is or God isn't. You can't take some of the Bible. It's either true or it's false. One plus one must always equal two, or the whole system is never going to work. You can't say one verse is true in the Bible, but this one is just folklore or myth. You can't do that and expect to have any uh, reverence or power from uh, reverence to God or power from God in your life. Either his word is true or it's not. And so when we pray, we must keep that in mind. He He's looking up and he's seeing the wonder of the heavens, the work of God's fingers. Uh, you'll see in other places where Jesus, uh, who was with God and was God and is God from the beginning, he was the craftsman uh, in, in the the design. He was the worker of the design. It was God's word who was Jesus, and he was, he was shaping out the created work of God. He refers to the moon and stars which you have set in place. Then so, so he, he's in his boundary of the earth, and he says, How majestic is your name in all the earth. He looks up, and he speaks of the glory of God in the creative work of the heavens. Now he looks inward in his prayer. And he says, What is man that you were mindful of him, verse 4, and the son of man that you care for him? What am I that you would look upon me, God. Remember me and care for me. In the vast humanity of the world, I am one small speck of sand, a particle of sand compared to the vast humanity. And what is it that you look at me and that you care about me? Wow, what a statement. You know, sometimes we uh, we think our we started our home and say, 
uh, this is the center of the universe. Or sometimes we look at our nation and we say the United States is the center of the universe or it, however we want to do that. But when we look up and we see the vastness, we realize that we are just a speck of dust in the vast humanity that is. And why is it that God is so mindful of us? In a word, it's love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In a word, it's love in that he demonstrated his love for us in that he sent his son to die on a cross. While we were at enmity with God, when we were distant from God, when we were separated from God, while we were still yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. Why, God, are you caring for me? Why are you mindful of me? In a word, love, his love cast upon us. He's infinite. How could I ever describe it in any other way? He continues by saying, you have made him, you have made man, men and women, me, a little lower than the heavenly beings. Some of your translations will say God there. We are lower than God. We are a little lower than uh, in our in our human mortality frailness uh, than the uh, heavenly host. And so uh, we, we need to know our position. We need to stop elevating ourselves and take ourselves to who and where we really are. But yet, look what he says. We are made a little lower than the heavenly beings, even God himself, and yet you crowned mankind with glory and honor. How did God do this? Well, when you read the verses 6 through 8, you'll see that God himself has given men and women dominion, that is rule, a governorship, uh, given us rule over the works of God's hands. God created and then he, he put man in the garden to take care of uh, his work. We know that we've fallen in sin through Adam. And so we gave over uh, to Satan what God had given us. Christ has redeemed it back. So in Christ, he has given me all these things. And so we have a dominion. We're to be stewards of what God has given us. And look what he says. You, you, you God, have put all things under mankind's feet. What, what does that mean? How many times in life... Do we think an event or someone, a person, uh, or some form of persecution is going to defeat us? Look what the psalmist just recognized in God's glory or majesty. You have put all things under our feet. And then he listed out the things that God has created. Church, here's what we need to see. We need God. We need his gift of grace, who is Jesus Christ, the salvation for all people who will believe. And we need to turn our life into trust of what God has written, what God has done, and what God has secured for us. This does not mean we're going to live in a rose garden. We've already seen the early Psalms where uh, David is on the run for his life and he's pleading to God to answer his prayer. And God does. We are not going to live in a rose garden in, in which we won't suffer. Uh, again, we have our own sins that cause consequence of suffering in our life. We have other sins who are cast upon us that we uh, deal with those wounds and those hurts in our life. And then we even have the environment that's broken. Who? do we trust at a day and age as now? We, we, prior to 2020, had not even heard of coronavirus 19. Uh, the leaders are literally building the bridge as they cross the water to figure this out. God already has the answer. God already has the provision. God already has the protection. God already has the deliverance. The question is not God. The question is your heart and my heart. 
Do we trust God or do we trust man? Do we trust God who is sovereign, how majestic is his name, or do we trust ourselves to build the bridge? This is where we are even today. Our prayer life uh, can do uh, just incredible wonders to exalt God and to uh, petition God so that our life is lived in victory instead of defeat. If we would get serious as Christians to the Word of God and to the prayers to God, resting our strength, resting our heart, resting our life, resting everything we have in God, we will see God's work and power and glory in a way that we could have never imagined. The battle is our own heart. He ends this psalm, Psalm 8, with these words again that we've already heard. O Lord, our Lord, sovereign God, eternal God, my master, how majestic is your name, authority, character, word, how majestic, how, uh, how large, how powerful, how glorious, how worthy is your name in all the earth. We need to incorporate the hallowedness of God's name in our prayer life. God expects us to come to him with our request, with our petitions, with our supplications, with our brokenness. And he desires the proper glory to his name for what he has done in being mindful and caring towards us. So as I asked you yesterday uh, to prepare your prayer to start your day this morning, I pray you did that. I hope you got your day started off, uh, your prayer in the morning to set your course right. Uh, today, when you, after I sign off and you have some alone time with the Lord, I want you to go to Psalm 8 and write down those phrases where he gives great glory to God. And begin to work in, in your journal how you will incorporate those in your prayers as you go forward. Uh, there's a manner in which to pray. We've already learned that uh, through Jesus uh, in the previous devotions. Now taking that manner, let's use some scriptural words incorporated into our heart, giving God all the glory. And let our petitions be trusted to the Lord. And let our praise uh, of our lips be uh, expanded and magnified to the Holy God. This is what we can do in our prayer life as we shut off the distractions and just come to the Lord's presence uh, and confess and to speak and to praise in our prayers. I pray you have a wonderful day in the Lord and we'll see you tomorrow again in our next devotion. And, uh, just be mindful to put these things to practice in your life. May God bless you and keep you, and we'll see you tomorrow.